As Nicholas said, uh, this is the bank finance panel, and my name is Brett Esper. I'm a partner in the Maritime Practice Group at Blank Rome. Um, I've been involved in finance and transactions work for companies in the maritime industry for over 30 years, and I've been attending and speaking uh, at conferences like this for over a decade. One of the most significant changes I've seen in my 30 plus years of work in vessel finance is the current diminished role of the traditional shipping bank in the financing of the shipping industry. I, I hope that's a fair characterization. They're, they're not quite as prominent as they were during the, uh, the boom cycle. Um, as we all know and remember, when the credit markets collapsed in the fall of 2008 and the Great Recession began, shipping banks held large portfolios of loans secured by assets whose values suddenly dropped by more than 50 percent and related earnings that dropped by even more. The need to address these portfolios of suddenly or soon to be distressed loans together with the need to comply with new, more stringent capital requirements caused most traditional shipping banks to all but close their lending windows to the industry. In fact, some did stop lending to the industry entirely. Uh, to put it simply, um, credit became very tight. But it's been over eight years since the downturn began. Where are the traditional shipping banks today? What is their current perception of the industry? What role do or should they play in the slow but steady movement toward the eventual market uh, recovery? So. With that introduction, uh, to answer those questions, we've assembled here this panel of uh, experienced shipping bankers. To my left here is Michael Parker, who is Global Industry Head for Shipping at Citi. Uh, next to Michael is, is Martin Van Tool, who's Managing Director, Shipping Finance for the Americas at DVB Bank. Next to him is Harris Antonio, CEO of Amsterdam Trade Bank. And next to Harris is Francis Berkland, Head of Shipping Americas at ABN AMRO. And next to Francis is Adam Conrad, who is the Group Head of Maritime Finance at CIT. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, so what I'd like to do is start our discussion uh, by asking uh, our bankers here about their current perception of the industry. Um, and I have to say, I sat through the dry bulk panel this morning, and it was a pleasant surprise to see so much optimism. But uh, I'm curious whether our bankers uh, perceive the same thing. So what I'd like to do is start with something positive and ask each of them to say something positive about a sector of the shipping industry. And by positive, I mean some market development, whether or not it was intended or it just was random, that they believe has or in the relative near term will promote recovery in that sector. Michael, you go first. Um, I have a slide that I'm not showing here, but I show at other occasions called Shipping um, in the Fourth Industrial Revolution using the Davos 2016 uh, agenda. Um, and I've started um, talking about shipping as a growth industry for the 21st century, and it's really the four pillars of regulation which we touched on just now. Uh, technology as a separate part of that, clearly. Um, crewless ships and, and those sort of things that Clay mentioned. The third issue being capital, which I'll come back to. And then the fourth is the invisible self-discipline that the people in the industry need to exercise. Um, and coming back to capital, which also you know, crosses over with regulation, the one thing the dry bulk panel did not talk about is where the money is going to come from. Uh, and I think in their case, maybe the money will come from uh, effectively equity. There'll be no debt financing. But I actually feel that because things have been so bad, that actually, you know, shipping as an industry is poised for really a very fantastic time. But of course, it does depend on which sector you're in and, and how you do your business. And I think what Matt's talked about, getting much closer to the cargo, is really where it's going to be more interesting for certainly banks. Um, equity may be a slightly different story. So the area that I think has led the way, and it led the way during the crisis in showing how it could adapt, it didn't, it didn't do it consistently, but it indicated the ability of the capacity owners to manage their capacity, because as you all know, too much money and too many ships is always the problem with this industry. So managing capacity, was shown by the container sector just after the crisis started. It was the first sector that really illustrated the problem when 
empty container ships were sitting outside Singapore and the world's buyers stopped buying until the inventory had been effectively sold. Now the container shipping industry has gone through, continuing to go through a rapid consolidation and the new alliances take place next month where you effectively will see three alliances, three groupings. The, the largest of the companies, Maersk, has said that they don't need any new ships. So when the largest company says we need no new ships and three alliances are absorbing all the existing capacity and the ships they know that will be delivered this year, you can immediately start to see that the desire to actually transform the business from a loss-making, uh, simply ordering capacity for its own sake is changing. And I think that is the sector that I think fundamentally will show the lead for the other sectors of shipping. Consolidation, they're not companies that the equity market can invest in in a significant way at the moment because of the way in which they're currently owned. But I think that the container, the container shipping sector will show the lead to the other sectors, what consolidation and a focus on the bottom line and managing the capacity to the demand can do. When earnings start to recover, uh, ship owners will realise that if they keep capacity under control, they can continue to earn money on a consistent basis. Uh, thanks, thanks, Michael. Martin, what, uh, where do you see uh, a positive development? Um, I think shipping as a whole is slowly getting better. Okay, the negative side is that it's slowly. We all like to have it more speedily, but I think, you know, being in this for five, six years now in a real downturn. Finally, optimism on dry bulk. Uh, there are sectors, there are certain other sectors that are still doing well. So there's, there's a much more, if you compare today to where here a year ago, people are far more positive. That's on the owning side. On the finance side, um, still a tough market out there to get financing, but we have a, a lot of private new initiatives never been one of them that, that come into shipping and, and I hope that uh, it sounds weird for wishing for more competition but we, we see more people that are willing to lift uh, the finance need we have. So I think that is also a positive element to this, uh, to this industry. Yeah, thank, thank you Martin. Harris, I know you've got some slides. Do what? you mind? Uh, What's that? Do you mind if I go through? No, no, not at all. Would you like to come up here? Yeah, sure. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Nicholas, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be back. I took the liberty to put my thoughts in a couple of slides, which I think they're going to provide food for thought for our discussion with this distinguished panel. Um, to start with, um, we need to always um, try to combine um, trade with shipping. And the world trade has been steadily going up for a number of years, 25 years approximately, uh, on a sort of steady upward sloping uh, uh, line, with the exception of the financial crisis where there was a little blip. But unfortunately, that's not what's happening with charter rates, and Clark's index is an indication of that. And the reason for it is probably overcapacity. And um, there are sectors that are uh, prone to overcapacity, and some sectors today are better positioned than others. In fact, in this graph on the table, the closer you are to the bottom left side of the graph, the better positioned you are for, 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 for an upturn in the market. Um, uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, because the order book as a percentage of fleet is very low, but also the order book um, as a percentage of uh, scrapping or as a multiple of scrapping is also very low. Um, that's something we can discuss uh, later. It seems that dry bulk and product tankers are well positioned. Um, of course, the other uh, positive element, because you asked us about positive elements, is the fact that a number of yards have gone out of business. There was significant capacity attrition to the tune of almost 40% in the past uh, 10 years, which actually helps a recovery. And, f and finally, you know, there's regulation that come to play, like water ballast uh, treatment regulations or, in fact, the new shelf regulation. Uh, it's not yet clear how these are going to affect the market, but uh, definitely we see a major impact uh, going forward. Um, and, of course, as uh, my uh, colleagues already mentioned, 
there has been a very significant attrition to SIP financing capacity over the past few years. In fact, 2016 was one of the lowest uh, levels of activity for the past uh, few years, and um, it coincided with, of course, very low uh, ordering uh, activity. And actually, I don't know perhaps exactly w whether it's the low ordering that creates low financing activity or the other way uh, around. Um, but uh, there's one very uh, clear uh, uh, message from this graph, and that uh, bank financing is and has been and will be in the future uh, the strongest supporter of the industry. And of course, today we are at a conundrum where we have seen a significant capacity attrition in terms of bank finance. Uh, there have been a number of players which you recognize that for a number of reasons decided to exit the market, others are maintaining or increasing, and there's a number of um, newcomers. But unfortunately, or fortunately for the industry, the vacuum that has been created by the exit of banks has not been filled by the newcomers. And I think um, this is very clear. It is also clear that the majority of the new capital is related to new buildings, particularly in China, which means that there's a significant part of the market, which is the second-hand market, that is not very active. And that's why we at uh, Amsterdam Trade Bank decided to put shipping in the core of our trade finance strategy, because we want and we are prepared to finance the whole uh, value chain for commodity uh, flows. And we do this out of a hub, the Netherlands, which is well positioned, in fact, as a global maritime hub. And I have a little quiz for you. Um, I don't know if anybody could guess what this um, graph uh, signifies. Definitely not a, the Clark's index. But what it is, actually, is the Obor strategy of China. And I'm very proud to be part of a group that, in fact, has a presence in every country from China all the way to Western uh, Europe in the land corridor. And, of course, through our maritime activities, we aspire to be active on the maritime corridor as well. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. And a small disclaimer as well. All right, thank you, Harris. So for, for Michael, I, what, I, what I heard is that he saw a positive development in the container sector resulting from consolidation, and you maybe even a toss into that, a, a bankruptcy of a Hanjin, and a, uh, a large carrier leaving the trade. And, and Martin, it sounded like you saw a, a sort of a positive bias, generally speaking, across the market. Harris, you seem to be somewhat focused on, on reduced shipbuilding as a positive element. And uh, so, Francis, what's your take? Where do you see something positive? Uh, I believe in that at least a few sectors where I'm uh, optimistic, but it is difficult to be optimistic uh, today. I mean, you have fewer banks, uh, international trade seems to rather go down than up. Um, uh, it is really difficult. But I, I think the great thing is that the mark, the, the shipping um, the segment, the shipping people are optimistic. Look at Rye Bulk. Uh, six months ago, I thought we would see opportunity there. Uh, everything was so low, there was basically nothing which could go worse. Last week, I think I've been contacted by at least three people I don't know. They, have, they want to buy dry bulk vessels. They have no dry bulk experience. So I think it goes so quickly. This is maybe the positive thing. People are optimistic. Are we really optimistic because people are positive? I'm not so sure. So where am I really uh, uh, optimistic? It's LNG and product tankers. I think on the LNG side, we see more and more FSRUs. Uh, I think 2% of the uh, regasification uh, um, capacity is land-based today. It's growing very quickly towards 10%. Uh, so LNG might finally uh, become more of a spot market uh, than it is today. Today, it's only long-term. Uh, uh, the, the spot market today is, is very weak. Vessels are making between twenty, thirty thousand dollars a day. That's not enough. Uh, so I think there is a positive development there. And product tankers as well. I think refinery capacity is uh, moving closer to uh, the production sites, meaning that there will be um, more shipments going forward. And that's more uh, uh, industrial themes on both sectors. If you look at the spot markets uh, on the dry bulk side or tanker side, they, because of the optimism I was describing first, I think they can adjust too quickly 
making the great you know, uh, recovery story shorter than we expect. Yeah. Okay, Adam, how about you? What's your take? Oh, so I guess I'm the last guy on the list here. <clears throat> so we're, we're cautious about the market, and I think that's the smartest thing to play right now. <clears throat> and obviously, being a banker, we get to earn a little bit of money while the equity earns all the upside. So for us, it's, uh, it's a good time to be cautious. Now, there are some uh, green shoots coming through. We know about them. It's discussed well in the dry bulk panel before that. And then, uh, obviously, the product tankers and crude looks, you know, it's down a little bit this year, but uh, long-term looks good. I think, overall, though, long-term shipping is, is uh, strong fundamentals. And you look at uh, BP, for example, put out their recent outlook, and they're not, you know, they're not the only ones that have said this, but uh, population is going to go from $7 billion <clears throat> to $8.5 billion. So it's 1.5 billion people more. So it's the equivalent of India or China adding to the planet over the next 20 years. It's estimated that car growth is going to increase from 900 million to 1.8 billion. And they were forecasting that the, uh, the consumption of gasoline and diesel goes from 19 million barrels to 23. So a small increase relatively to the size. And really, it's going to be a combination of small pieces that is, enter is uh, electric cars, but the biggest piece is fuel efficiency. And that's going to be the challenge in the markets is, are we, you know, for, for support shipping, are the forecasts for demand going to hit it in the sense that, that will product, be, will car manufacturers, for example, be able to achieve those miles mm -hmm. per gallon? Will yield, crop yields increase in, in the U.S. and in the OECD countries? Will all of that occur to meet population demands? Not to mention that you're seeing one of the largest shifts of populations occurring in Asia from the rural communities to the cities. So that long term is good. It's good, just a short term. Great, great to hear some positive <laughs> comments about the industry. Well, to find short term and long term, that's always the challenge. Well, yeah, uh, that's if we, money can outlast who, the market. Who this trough would last right. this long. Well, let's talk about the funding of the, interest, uh, the industry. Uh, I'd like to know what you think are the greatest funding needs of the industry. Is it to refinance existing debt? I mean, for quite some time now, I think it was all about runway and who would be alive when the recovery finally came. And so facing, you know, maturity dates was a significant concern of the industry. We have consolidation occurring now. Um, and that needs to be funded. Um, and also some companies are looking to grow. So I'd like to ask you what you think the greatest funding needs of the industry are. And uh, Adam, you are so patient. Why don't we start with you and we'll work the other way? Sure. I think, I think it's refinancing. Um, as my colleagues in the panel sent, uh, bank capital is difficult to find these days. It's challenging and it's to be expected in the market that we've had over the last several years. Um, there have been some traditional ship owner or ship bankings that that's been challenged by this. New capital requirements have been pushed up across the globe as a result of the um, the global recession that occurred in 2008, 2009. So I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for the industry. Yeah. Francis, do you agree? Uh, I would agree um, because on the refinancing situation, you, you you're forced to take a decision. On the consolidation side, as a bank, you might step up and there might not be any consolidation. You're not forced into uh, the refinancing. However, many of the refinancings, banks are pushed to continue. The, the, the transactions are already financed. So it's not necessarily new money coming in. It's just how would the existing uh, creditors just uh, uh, make the lenders flip it over to a new facility. We have fewer and fewer banks, in, uh, commercial banks, uh, but a, a few new ones as well. But I don't think the new banks are uh, covering all the liquidity disappearing. So this is a big challenge. Uh, so the challenge is to either increase to substitute those uh, exiting lenders or to keep those lenders in because it's better than not being able to refinance. Yeah, yeah. Well, I shifted a little bit here. Um, the, the role of the shipping bank in the industry today, um, I want to ask the panel, what, what do you think is the most productive role shipping banks can play in the industry um, to assist with the recovery? Michael, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Well, obviously not to do what we've done for the last 50 years because we haven't done anything other than wipe out capital for most ship owners and most shareholders and most banks. And I think one of the... So the two things I want to say on this, 
the business models are changing. If you look at what Maersk's strategy is, which feeds slightly into what Harris talked about, the institution he now works for, it's, it's connecting, if you like, the flows. And of course, technology will have a significant impact on that with the effect of digitalization on, particularly on um, container shipping, which is why I think that's an area I'm very optimistic about. But the other thing is the regulators. The European regulators have not finished there is probably about $150 billion of distressed bank debt stuck with Europe, mainly European banks, mainly German, that has still got to be degorged from the system. And of the sort of 1.2 trillion of, of financing for the industry, including equity, about six, 700 million is generally considered to be bank debt, including parts of the export credit uh, exposure to the industry. About 300 of that still has to be effectively taken out or will be taken out by the time the banks that were on the left-hand side of Harris's slide, the people exiting the industry, have left and other banks have shrunk their portfolios. So the, the message I want to deliver is there is no new money for shipping, which is a good thing. The belief that the regulators will allow the banks to go back to creating the disaster they created five, ten years ago, I think is highly unlikely. Now, it may well be that there are other institutions that will come in and feed Robert Bugby's higher values, but I don't think he's going to find banks financing his new ships, not, certainly not in the way they did before. And so I think the role of the shipping bank, as far as the uh, boards of directors of those banks are going to be, is to get much closer to the cargo, get much closer to the changing business models, and redefine shipping as an industrialized portfolio in a bank that is relevant to the 21st century. So the sort of asset play thing that Baal II allowed, which is really what we're still dealing with, I don't think is going to happen again. That's why I'm very optimistic about the future of the industry. I'm very optimistic, partly because things are so bad now and banks are not going to be allowed to do very much, hopefully. And that way we will get through the, the difficulties we are in now, but it won't be by throwing money as values go up at, at new buildings. So there are the Chinese out there, but I don't think the Chinese are going to replace the volume that the German banks represented in the last 25 years. Uh, we'll have to watch that clearly, but they, they've tended to stick to things that have a direct relevance to China, and I think they're also the Chinese authorities' concerned that the leasing companies there you know, don't overextend themselves. So I think the role of the shipping bank is to redefine in our, in our banks what that business actually is, and that's where I think consolidation will help. I also think that will help from an equity perspective because we'll have much bigger companies being able to raise significant amounts of external equity. So I want to make a comment on that as I was listening to you just, just uh, talk then. Um, you know, what I saw during the boom period was an awful lot of syndication and I saw a lot of banks making a lot of fees syndicating loans and it was not that dissimilar to, you know, the market for to draw some, a mild analogy, just the, the subprime lending market in that, you know, there was just a lot of activity that was, that was spread out over a bunch of people. Um, did, does anybody agree? I mean, do you, do, do you think that shipping banks got away from sort of the personal banking relationship and got into uh, a little bit more um, just a business of arranging loans and syndicating them? Was that a problem during the boom period? Um, no, I don't. I don't share the view. I don't think it was a problem. It was a, there was obviously a uh, where things went wrong with hindsight is that banks stepped away from you know the normal ABC of ship finance. You, you can't do a hundred million on on a cape. I mean that's that's ridiculous. So that that's where the problem was. The fact the fact that you have a syndicating model and that you that you're able to arrange the capital that is needed for the industry is, is a good thing in itself. Mm -hmm. And I, of course there there were there were quite a few banks that had never done shipping, saw nice values, shiny balance sheets and, and stepped in and, and got burned. Um, but, but I think for shipping, it, it was great. Was there too much focus on syndication, though? Uh, you know, when you talk about it doesn't make sense to put up $100 million for a cape, you have to ask why, why did that happen? And, you know, it, uh, I, I don't have the answer, but I just I wonder think, whether I there was too much focus on syndication. Most, I would say most 
banks that were arranging financing and were the agent and, and big arranger kept part of the transaction. I mean, only very, sure. very few and often you know, offloaded it yep. completely. Sure. And, and there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of repackaging and slicing and dicing and, and all that. So the comparison with, with subprime, I, I don't see that, to yeah. be honest. But, but so, so where shipping took a wrong turn is that believing that the, the, the new paradigm that everybody talked about back then. Yeah. It, it wasn't there. You can't do 100 million on a cape, yeah. period. Yeah, yeah. And that is, if you, if you talk about the new role of bank today, is, is basically, and there's a very self-serving answer, uh, be conservative, install discipline, and, and we, we have the chance to do that now, and uh, let's see how far we get. That would, that would be very helpful and productive. <laughs> Harris? Yes. Yeah, if I may like add to this, um, I, I concur with my colleagues here, but I think there's one major um, issue that we haven't touched upon, and that's the timing perspective. Can you use the mic? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, the perspective of time, because we had the um, CEOs of the dry bulk uh, companies earlier today in fact, uh, having a discussion about whether shipping is an asset-based industry or a cash flow-based one. And I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. But the difference between an equity investor, uh, definitely the one of the capital markets, and a bank is that a bank is there for the long run. And the equity investor can, at a click of a button, exit his position or her position. And that, that makes a huge difference to how we look at the industry and whether we should be paying attention to both cash flows as well as the asset values. And in fact, I recall in, in 2007, we had a, a strategic sort of review of our portfolio when I was running the transportation group at Forris with a number of colleagues around the table. And at that point in time, we had Marshall and we discussed um, you know, the future. And that was exactly the point in time that CAPES were going for 100 million or more. And we made a decision in 2007, in fact, to stop financing CAPES altogether. And but, so what makes certain banks take certain hard decisions to exit the market and others to continue, I think that has to do also with the definition of your um, market. And in fact, a lot of banks fell into the trap of trying to uh, maintain profitability at previous year's levels mm -hmm. just by adding assets to the balance sheet mm -hmm. at margins that were kept on, keep on getting, kept on getting uh, thinner and thinner. And I think that was really a, a mistake. It was the wrong underwriting principle. And I hope that banks will not make that mistake again in pricing themselves out of the market effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Francis, let me ask you, or you look like you wanted to say something, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think it may be an error. We've decided uh, to be very cautious with new buildings. We believe that a number of new building projects might look very attractive to us. You may have long-term charter attached to it. You may have uh, uh, cheap export financing. However, we are you know, uh, uh, sowing our own uh, branch at which we're sitting. You know, that we, are, uh, we should make sure you don't add more dry bulk uh, vessels, even in this fantastic market today, uh, where the vessels, you know, are able to pay their interest uh, on the debt. Uh -huh. uh, so we, we are very careful about new buildings, and in particular, uh, speculative newcomers uh, with a great project, which really yeah. looked, would have worked very well uh, in our models uh, in the past and are still working well, but we feel if that's only to fuel you know, more supply uh, into a market which is not yet in balance. Uh, no. It's important that we, we s give a strong signal on that. Yep. Well, it sounds like everyone has learned some hard lessons. Adam, let me ask you, I mean, what do you spend most of your time on these days then? Where is your focus um, in terms of, of uh, new deals that you're looking to do? Uh, for us, it's, you know, we're the, <clears throat> we're the relatively new entrance. We, we kicked off in 2012. So we just went through the worst, you know, the worst cycle in the last 50 years. So that was uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> something I want to repeat again. But you know, it, it, for us, you know, we we spend a lot of time in portfolio management, and we've done studies in the past that show that 67% of all deals go bad because of portfolio management, not because of the deal you underwrote, not because the market was in, because you didn't pay attention. So we work with our owners. It's not it, they're not easy conversations. But uh, you know, we, we make sure there's a good flow of information between us and them. And we, you know, for us, we talk about cash flow. We, of course, we talk about assets. We also talk about the equity that's behind it. Do they have the capabilities? Are they willing? Have they been in the space before? And we make sure that if you're not and you're a new investor, that you're partnered up with someone who is. 
because you can't save yourself out of the market. I mean, we heard that in the drive bulk panel. Hamish was talking about expenses. But unlike a manufacturing where you could shut down a facility, consolidate, or invest in a new patent or something like this, this is a market that when revenue's down, you have to hunker down and you've got to work with your banks. Thanks. We've got about a minute and a half left. Um, I'd like to just open it up to the audience. Does anyone have a, a question for the panel? Okay, and it doesn't look like it. Okay, um, well, let's just wrap it up with, um, with uh, one last question here. And I, I, I guess we kind of touched on lessons learned. So let me, let me just ask uh, the panel to sort of put themselves in the shoes of their customer. If, if you were running a, a shipping company today, and let's say it's a new, newly formed company with fresh capital, um, you know, how would you finance your business? Um, and what role would uh, commercial uh, uh, bank debt play in that capital structure? Harris, I'll start with you right in the middle. Well, um, I think this will pay a visit to Amsterdam. It's a beautiful city. And, um, uh, but in reality, the, um, the, the challenge today of, for a ship owner is that up until a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was actually quite challenging to add a lot of debt to your capital structure, simply because the numbers don't pan out. And in fact, Paul has earlier said that ships are still losing money today because they're operating at below break even. So talking too much about you know, adding leverage today to your fleet uh, doesn't make sense. Of course, a little bit of leverage is prudent. I think it helps you, uh, in fact, uh, make better use of your equity. And I think that's the way to go. Yeah. Um, okay. Anybody else have a different thought on that or comment? I, I think you, you have two perspectives. You have uh, the distressed situations. You could, as an investor, uh, put up some new equity, buying an option into a situation with high leverage, soft terms from an existing uh, lending group uh, by just giving s some more equity. Uh, but that's the option. Uh, and next to that uh, optional investment, you should have, a, as uh, uh, Harry said, a more conservative uh, balance sheet. Uh, and Amsterdam is indeed a very nice city with uh, Eben Amro's head office. So very good. Welcome to Amsterdam. Well, thanks very much. I, I notice we've run out of time, so uh, I just want to thank the panel uh, for their comments and the audience for their attention, and uh, thanks very much. Thank you.